Okay, it looks like uh, people are starting to populate in. We'll give it a couple more moments until um, everyone can get in, but it uh, looks like we have a good attendance group right now, but let's just give it a little bit more. Okay, looks like we have a good group here. Uh, in respect for everyone's time, we'll just get going ahead. It's 12 o'clock. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Ferdyhurt, and welcome to our Advanced Care Planning Care, Caring Conversations uh, Workshop webinar. This is a ongoing series. We have, uh, I believe, four of these uh, we're putting out there for National Healthcare Decisions Day. Uh, with us is Linda, and I'll let you introduce yourself, and we can start going. Um, if anyone has any questions, there is the Q&A function and then also the chat. Um, if you populate in there, we'll try to leave some time at the end of the presentation so that we can answer some of your questions more directly. Uh, thank you everyone for attending and let's get going. Thank you, Ryan, and thanks to all of you who've joined us today. Um, looking forward to talking about the Center's Caring Conversations program. And as uh, Ryan has lots of clinical experience in addition to all the experience I've had in working with families around advanced care plans for the last 15 years. I've been um, just recently retired as Executive Vice President of the Center for Practical Bioethics. And it's my pleasure to continue doing some of these workshops um, in retirement. It's uh, important work and I know it makes a difference for families. So um, let's get to it, Ryan, if you'll give it the first slide, please. There may be some of you who are not familiar with the center. Uh, we're a national leader in bioethics founded in 1984. And some particularly important elements um, that describe the center are that it's freestanding. We're not affiliated with anybody else formally. We're a not-for-profit. And a lot of the work Ryan and other colleagues do is train hospital ethics committees. And uh, we also train clinicians around um, ethics. And then uh, we're an independent resource. We're not the insurance company. We're not your doctor. And our tagline is guidance at the crossroads of decision. And uh, we hope you all will feel some of that uh, help today. So let's get right into it. Next. Um, what is Caring Conversations? It's the name of a program that uh, the center has been doing for over 20 years. It is um, really for everyone, but especially those who are dealing with advanced illness or are responsible for a loved one. Um, and um, I think, let me see if I can dismiss this if it's mine. Sorry. Um, so it is. It involves four things: the the first two, consultation and coaching, and then advocacy if needed. And the other elements of it are relevant information about resources to help you sort out these complex situations. And educational programs about advanced care planning, like this one, which we hope will help you and your family get clear on your own goals and values and making sure your healthcare preferences are known and honored when the time comes. So having the opportunity to reflect before there is a, a healthcare crisis it makes all the difference. It makes the difference between a family that's torn apart by disagreements over what mom would have wanted um, or the peaceful dignified end that we all say we want for ourselves and those we love. We know doing this work can make that difference. Advanced care planning is kind of a conundrum because um, we're a very death averse society. Uh, nobody in the United States wants to talk about or think about serious illness, goals of care or death, even in a pandemic crisis as we're experiencing now. Um, and, and if things are going well for you and people are feeling pretty good, um, nobody wants to think about this. But this is exactly the time to have these conversations, to make your plans, to share it with your family, 
And we really, from long experience, beg you not to wait until you or your loved ones are seriously ill to begin this process. So the program has a variety of tools to guide you through it. And um, this, this talk is one of them. And let's go to the next slide, Ryan, and we'll get right into this. First, uh, a couple of, of mistaken beliefs. If you don't hold these, I, I can promise that some older members in your family might. Uh, and this is the hubris we all have that I'll always be able to make my own decisions. Uh, the data just does not support that. So um, I'd like you to let go of that one today. Next. Um, other reasons for caring conversation here and that support that the reason that's not true is that if, in fact, 85% of us will die without the capacity to make decisions or on life support. Um, it, it can be that uh, you're heavily medicated or your loved one is heavy, heavily medicated because of pain. It may be that there's a tube down your throat or all kinds of reasons, but the data say 85% of us will die without the capacity to be making our own decisions. And I use this, the uh, photo on this slide because it's a shift change at a teaching hospital. Um, and and then the lesson here, it's complicated. We have fabulous people at work in our hospitals during COVID as we are now under extraordinary, diff extraordinarily difficult conditions. But even in, with, with healthcare workers of, of good faith, it's good to have a family member who knows the wishes of your loved one who's hospitalized and who can communicate. And if that's you, a family member who can communicate on your behalf. Next. So how we die is changing. Most of us uh, will die from complications from chronic illnesses. You'll see that in a few minutes with slow and uncertain disease paths affected by dementia. Um, the world's turned upside down with COVID. Many, many uh, people have died from COVID. Um, and we know that legalistic forms are limited in what they can anticipate and how well they can guide the agent who's making decisions on behalf of the person who is dying. So even in talking to your family, even with the best intentions, um, it's hard to, um, to anticipate all the what ifs. Next slide. We know that legalistic forms are limited and what they can anticipate. And this pictures of illness slide really helps narrow that down. Um, the first slide, trajectory one, is, is a sudden death, um, really a, a, a traumatic accident, uh, something. And um, while this isn't the primary way people die, it is a way people die. Many, many people die this way. And this is a picture of my dad. He went to bed one night, uh, exactly the same age I am now, 73, and didn't wake up. His death certificate says arrhythmia. Um, he had had no prior illness, and uh, all of you know people who have died like this. The second one is our, our, our colleague, uh, Lorella Boo, who was our um, beloved marketing person. He called me one morning and said, Linda, I'm gonna be late to work. I kind of passed out at breakfast and Diane's making me go to the doctor. Um, he said, I'll be, in, I'll be in soon, but I'm gonna be late. The next call I got was from Diane saying, meet us at the emergency department. And my colleague had been diagnosed with a glioblastoma multiform brain tumor. Um, that conversation was in October and he had died by the end of January. There were a number of decisions that were made along the way. You see that little short line, but there was a very abrupt um, slide uh, to his ultimate and untimely death. The last, the number three one and number four are by far the most common ways people are dying now. One is, uh, number three is the one that describes people with chronic heart or lung conditions where they're doing pretty well and then they have an event and um, they get taken to the hospital and then they're a little bit better and better enough to go back uh, to uh, where they've lived before. And then they have another episode and, and another episode and another episode. So you have this kind of uh, slow decline 
um, where we're never quite as good as we were before, but we survive for a long time. Lots of decisions get made on a trajectory like this. And sometimes patients in these situations are able to participate in those decisions. The fourth one's my sweet mom. She died of Alzheimer's over many, many years. Um, and there's this period of, of dwindling where um, not only is capacity lost, but sometimes other physical things happen. And we were very, very grateful for her at a very early phase of, of her diagnosis, sitting my sister and me down and telling us exactly what she wanted. Uh, I can't tell you what a gift that was to us over the next several years where she was unable to communicate with us at all. But she was very clear and those who knew my mother would, would recognize um, her instructions. She said things like, um, I wanna be at home as long as I can be at home, even if I have to have in-home in health. Um, I never wanna live with one of you. We were both devastated when she said that, but she said, you're both working, you have families. Um, and I, I, don't want, I, I don't want that. I would rather live at home with help or in a nursing home. She was very specific. So at every step along this journey, my sister and I knew exactly what mother would have wanted. She even said, and at some point I'll have to be in an outside facility and I want it to be nice, but not too nice because you know I wouldn't wanna spend that much money. Very frugal person. Um, and and we, we were able to honor her wishes. Next. So what we say we want versus what we get um, is, is a stark contrast. All of us say we wanna be pain-free, symptoms managed in our own bed as my mom, hooked, uh, versus hooked up to tubes and machines, often in pain in the ICU. Anybody you, you survey says that. We want our wishes known and honored versus family and care provider disputes. We don't want our family in a fight in the waiting room about what should happen to us. And we want the psychosocial needs of our family met versus isolation. So in the next slide, Ryan, um, if you'll advance us and um, go to the next one, this is the contrast of what we want and what we get. And um, what we want at home, surrounded by, by loved ones. Um, the picture on the left is used with the permission of this family, the, the woman. Uh, in the foreground is a long, long time member of the board of directors of the Center for Practical Bioethics. Um, she has uh, two daughters, one's in the bed next to her. Uh, the other one took the picture and sent it to me and said, mom wants you to use this in your, in your um, caring conversations workshops because she had made the decision even if she had a, a, a critical event, she did not want to be taken to the hospital. Um, she died in that bed a few days, a few weeks after this picture was taken. On the right is a familiar picture of somebody in an uh, intensive care unit, exactly where you want to be if you're seriously ill and can get better. Um, if you've been in a wreck or all kinds of reasons, we want to be in the ICU. But at the time of our death is not a reason to be in the ICU, isolated from family in the waiting room. Um, the opposite of what most of us say we want. Next. So COVID-19 has changed everything, of course, and never more important than right now to have these conversations because while many of us are getting the vaccine, it'll be a while before uh, we reach uh, any kind of safety relative to the, to the virus. And it's certainly no respecter of persons. Any one of us can get it. Um, we've been through this period with people in nursing homes un, unable to have family close by. And a lot of these conversations at the end of life for these patients, these residents of, of nursing homes, have been by Zoom or a simple phone call. Uh, not ideal, but better than nothing. And we know this Caring Conversations program ahead of a crisis can help. Next. So there's some other mistaken beliefs we have to deal with. Um, I'm, I'm in a pretty close family and my family already knows your wishes. So this is where you get involved in this talk. I want each one of you, if you have something to write on, um, just think for a second, what was the last conversation you had with somebody you live with or somebody who's close to you? Um, and if you're like me, it was my husband had a dental appointment this morning 
It was, what time will you be home? Um, when's your talk? Uh, what are we having for dinner? The, the, the conversations we have, uh, our activities of daily living really dominate our conversations with our family. It's very unusual for us to have a deep conversation and certainly it's difficult and unusual for us to have one where anybody's talking about death or dying. So your family doesn't already know your wishes unless you have talked about it. Next. This is my don't assume that your family, uh, the family member you think of is the one who will make your decisions is up for that task. And um, I hope this story will help you recall that so that you really do tack that down in your family. Who's speaking for whom when the time comes? Um, I got a call from the waiting room of one of our big hospitals in, in our region. And uh, the question was, and often is the first question is not the question, but the question was, um, if mom put two names on the top line of her advanced directives, or her advanced directive, who gets to decide? If mom put two names on the top line of her advanced directive, who gets to decide? And in the background, I could hardly hear this woman because of all the rowdy conversation that was going on, very loud, very angry. And I said, well, tell me a little bit more about what's going on. And she said, well, my mom has an advanced directive. And she said, I'm, I'm the middle daughter. She asked me to do it, but I, I told her no, because I have 12 siblings. I'm a middle daughter. And I said, mom, nobody listens to me. I can't do this for you. So she put my oldest brother and my oldest sister on the top line. And she said, the two loud voices you're hearing right now are my oldest brother and my oldest sister. They never have gotten along. And all that's just playing out in a terrible way right now. And I said, well, is your mom conscious? And she said, oh, absolutely, she's conscious. And I said, is she able to make decisions for herself? Oh, yes, she's able to make decisions for herself. And I said, then nobody in the waiting room gets to decide. As long as you are able to make your own decisions, you make your own decisions. And I said, um, you, you and your family, your brother, sisters, whoever, your next step is to get in there, make sure that the care team is very clear with your mom exactly about what her status is, what her prognosis is, what her options are. And then she makes the decisions until she cannot. And the next thing she has to do is decide which one of you will speak for her when she cannot speak for herself. Very important lesson, don't assume. Another mistake and belief, my doctor will know what's right. Um, your doctor is not gonna be in the nursing home or the hospital with you. Uh, those days are gone. There may be a couple people, next slide, on, on this. Um, uh, there, there may be a couple people on this call who remember when your doctor made rounds regularly in hospitals if his patients, his or her patients were hospitalized, but that doesn't happen anymore. Um, your physician may not know exactly what's going on um, with you and will not be in the hospital. Uh, hospitalists are the norm now. It's a whole uh, medical specialty. These are uh, very well-qualified hospitalists. Uh, physicians who round in hospitals um, and that's their job. They don't have, they don't see patients outside of the hospital, but they do not know you um, like your family doctor might. They may be in touch, but you can't count on that. Um, my quick story here is um, our, in our family, nobody goes to the hospital alone. And that of course has all changed with COVID. But when, when we could, we would, we would, move into the comfortable chair or the cot or whatever and be right there. Uh, and, and some of that goes back to that picture I showed you of the busy shift change in a hospital. Uh, hospital workers have many, many patients to take care of. And we always have somebody go when somebody's in the hospital. So my Aunt Ruth was gonna be hospitalized for a weekend for some tests. And um, her her primary caregiver was going to be out of town and called and said, will you and Sandra um, go to the hospital with Aunt Ruth? We said, of course. We went to the hospital with Aunt Ruth and she was in Friday afternoon to Sunday afternoon. And over that period of time, we saw six different hospitalists. 
none of whom had ever seen Aunt Ruth before, didn't know her, her story. Um, she was certainly able to answer their questions, but they had a whole wing of people they were taking care of, of course. So many of you may remember the old series, Dr. Welby on, on TV. He was the neighborhood family doctor and he always went to the hospital with you. Um, Dr. Welby isn't coming to visit Aunt Ruth anymore. So that is up to the family. Um, and don't assume that that your, your doc is going to be there who knows you well making all the calls. Next. And, you know, this is just a fact of life. Hospitals have to be concerned about anything related to liability. And we have this phenomenon that's so common that we call it the son from California, where some, some sibling of mom, mom, one of mom's kids at the last minute gets called that mom is dying, hasn't been home in 25 years, but comes flying in and, and tells the hospital if they don't do everything to save mom, they're gonna sue you because they still have unfinished business with mom. Um, it might sound uh, far-fetched, but I promise you this happens. Next. And there are, there are some limitations, even if you do a living will of a form, and that's why the Caring Conversations program is different. We have the living will forms, which we'll talk about in a minute, but the workbook also gives you a chance to, to talk about things in a more uh, broad way than simply checking some boxes uh, on, on a form. And, and so this legalistic approach alone is, is really not enough. And talking with loved ones is crucial ahead of the crisis, have these conversations. And the conversations are critical. That's why we named it Caring Conversations and not Caring Documents. Um, the conversations are the most important thing. The documents just help get it in writing. Next. Another mistake and belief, I've written it down so I don't need to talk. Um, a lot of times people have done these formal documents but we don't know where to find it. I and mean, people are rifling through desks. People sometimes put them in their safety deposit boxes, the very worst possible place, because not only do you not know what's there, but even if you did, nobody knows where the key is. Um, or even if you find the documents and your loved one can't speak, well, what did he mean by that? What did he mean when he checked that? Um, another reason we call it carrying conversations, not carrying documents. Next. So some people are very surprised that if your 18 year old is hospitalized, uh, your 18 year old gets to make decisions and um, anybody 18 or older uh, uh, needs to have a healthcare proxy identified, a person named to speak for you when you can't speak for yourself. So you think about who every one of you right now, I know a lot of you are on this call because you're taking care of somebody else, but I want you to start with your own work. Who will make decisions for you in the event you can't? Uh, and how do you decide? It's not an easy task. And I will tell you, as you think about this, not all of your family members and friends are created equal when it comes to being good in a crisis. You have to really think this through. I've done many, many of these workshops. And in person, I ask people in the room, how many have more than one child? And many, many hands go up and I say, how many of them are good in a crisis? And who is the best in a crisis? And they always have one person that they think of as being best in a crisis. That's who you wanna to talk to, the person that will, will have the ability to pull the family together, be calm and make unthinkably hard decisions. Next. So I hope I've convinced you that um, conversations are key, but the data supports this. Um, earlier conversations about patient goals and priorities for living with uh, serious illness have all kinds of well-researched better outcomes. Um, this, this is more language that you would see in, in, a, in a research document. Enhanced goal concordant care simply means that the patient's goals uh, are more aligned with the care they actually get. You have improved quality of life, reduced suffering, better patient and family coping, higher patient satisfaction right up to the point of death. And then of course the byproduct of this, which should matter all of us is less non-beneficial non care and costs. There's always one more procedure, one more treatment, one more thing 
that we can try, but at some point um, we need to be honest about when to say enough. Next. And we know from also multiple studies that too little too late is not great. And, and this, is, this is the thing, only about 30% of Americans have really done this work and have an advanced care plan, even though when you survey Americans, 98% say it's a good idea. Um, but multiple studies show patients with serious medical in illnesses don't even discuss in their end of life preferences, or they first discuss them only in the last days to a month of life. And then they did uh, special studies on ca advanced cancer patients. And then these are just horrifying statistics to me. The first end of life decision occurred a median 33 days before death. And 55% of initial end of life discussion occurred when somebody's already hospitalized. And only 25% of those discussions were conducted by the patient's oncologist. So, you know, an oncologist who's trying to cure your cancer, it's a difficult conversation for them to say, you know what, curative methods are not the best thing for us to try to pursue. They have proved to be inadequate, not up to the task, but there are many things we can do to make sure you are comfortable and uh, we'll get through this together. Next. So we have some tools um, that are available online that you can download or that you can order. I've got a copy of this little flip book uh, in my hands that you see a picture of, but you can see it just has a little large print. I don't know that you can see that large print um, with some conversation starters from, from families who never have conversations deeper than what, what are we having for dinner uh, or can you believe that this team did so badly in, in um, the NCAA tournament last night? Um, they just don't have a way to start deeper conversations. And this little workbook gives you some ideas. The person who's influenced me most is. From that person I learned. Um, if I could not make my healthcare wishes known, my greatest concern would be and um, you know, there's a whole booklet of these. If you don't like one, go to the next one. But if you're worried about your ability to get your family to do this, consider this, this aid. Next. Um, the Caring Conversations workbook, uh, the directions for downloading it, I think came with the invitation to this webinar, but you can go to practicalbioethics.org you can download a copy for free. If you want a whole bunch, you can order them from the center. But um, here is that workbook that you see on, on your screen. It's not a big workbook. It's just got 15 pages and it's organized in four sections. The first one, um, and people always say to me, oh, I just can't get my dad to do this. And I will, I will promise you with all my heart, the way to get your dad to do this is for you to do the work first, do your own work first, and, and then take it to your dad and say, anybody over 18 or over dad needs one of these. And I've done mine and I'm asking you to give us the gift of you doing yours. Um, it's in four parts. It gives you a chance to reflect on your own values and then to talk about it. Um, once again, go back to the slide where the mother had talked to the daughter and she had said, no, I don't want to do this. So you have to talk to the people you would like to have do this um, and then appoint them. And by appointing them, we talk about this part of the thing that you can't see, sorry. It's a durable power of attorney for healthcare decision-making. And then on the reverse side in the, in the middle of the workbook, is actually what we call a health treatment directive or a living will that lets you describe that, um, what, what your wishes are. But all through the book, you, you appoint somebody, you document it by uh, acting on, on your, your research and your conversations, and then you share this document. Let's go to the next, um, next slide. Reflecting on your own values, beliefs, and concerns, next. Um, think about what's important to you about the care you receive at end of life. Next. 
what does it mean to you and your loved ones to die well? It's not the same for everybody, but as I said earlier, there's some pretty uh, constant themes. And what does a de good death look like to you? Next. So in the workbook, as I said, there's this order in it. You talk with loved ones about your wishes, and then you appoint the person you think is most able to act on your behalf based on your preliminary conversations. Next. Um, documenting this is, is possible certainly um, by using this workbook. It's also possible now to do it um, online. And um, I'm gonna ask Ryan to jump in here for a second and talk a little bit about my directives, which is an online uh, option. You can, and part of that is you can either upload to my directives what you've written, but my directives also has a version of this. So um, you wanna um, talk about that a little bit, Ryan? Sure, uh, you actually did a very good job describing it, but um, with the, growing in technology and uh, cloud-based computing and stuff like that, we're uh, having more available options. And the importance of this work is being recognized and trying to use the technology to meet people where they are. So as you said, uh, instead of keeping the advanced directive in the safety deposit box or uh, hidden away in the closet in the safe, uh, we wanna make sure it's as available as possible. And one of those programs is through my directives. It's a website and you can uh, fill out questions online. Uh, you can upload your workbook and you can, it also will help you uh, think of um, some questions uh, through itself and answering them. And through that work, you can um, store it in a cloud-based server. And what that means is um, you can be able to access it anywhere that you can get an internet access. So we've seen it come in handy where a patient is in the hospital and a loved one's there and we say, do you have an advanced directive? Do you have a living will? And they say, yeah, I know um, mom or dad or whoever is in the, uh, the patient. Well, yes, they have one. And then a lot of times in the clinic, we say, will you be able to get that for us? And then a couple of days may go by. Uh, now we've seen them say, yeah, sure, one second. They pull out their phone type in a couple uh, passwords and sign in, and they're able to access um, the, their loved one's living will right then and there. And it really helps to uh, streamline the conversation process and also make that information available. Uh, we don't wanna make, we wanna make sure that this stuff is accessible and not just uh, completed and then forgotten about. As we talked about, um, it's a conversation. It's not just the completion, completion of a document. So making sure that they are well-informed and completed and then also available to be accessed so that whenever the time comes, we're able to have these um, answers and medical preferences put into practice. Thank you. And let's keep going. I've got um, some more reinforcement of what you were just talking about here. Um, this is what the two documents look like uh, and they're back to back in the workbook. But to Ryan's point, you can use my directives and you can also use a fillable PDF that's also on our website um, in, in which you fill out the whole rest of the, the workbook online. But you do have to have uh, these documents notarized and witnessed. So you'll be printing a copy anyway, but then once it's done, you can scan it and have it on your phone um, to make it very available. Keep going here. Um, so when you hear people talk about, well, what is an advanced directive, it's really a combination of these two documents, the durable power of attorney for healthcare decision making, which I think many of us would argue is the most important document of the two. And then the healthcare directive living well is where you document what you've told that person. Um, and together they make an advanced directive. Um, the next slide is about my directives, a way to store your video or documents, workbook in a cloud. And um, another thing that we really recommend, this is a powerful tool. Your phone is, your pow is a powerful tool. You can do a video recording of mom and what she would like uh, if she doesn't have one of these um, wonderful durable powers of attorney and upload that video um, uh, when the son from California arrives, uh, you can share mom saying, this is what I want and this is what I don't want. Um, and it's a very powerful to, tool. So I'm, I'm confident you have a good grasp of this program and what the elements are, but 
people still find this very difficult. People say to me all the time, I just cannot get my dad to do this. I'm on this call because I can't get my dad to do this or my mom or my grandparent. And I would, I would just say, um, encourage others by doing your own work first. If you do your own work, if you use comfortable language and take your time uh, in your own homework, then you are, you are much re more ready to share that with somebody else. And, and as I said, anybody 18 or older, so when you have these documents in hand and go to your dad or your mom, could say, this is my gift to you and, and the rest of my family. I don't want our family in a fight if I'm in a car wreck and, and nobody knows whether I'm going to survive or not and decisions have to be made. I want my family not to be in a fight over this so that nobody has Thanksgiving together anymore. And I'm asking you, dad, mom, grandmother, grandfather, to give us that same gift. Next. So as you're having this conversation, you know, we are so death averse in this country. We just do not like talking about it. But as you as you go through it, um, you know, try to talk about it in a natural way. That great Forrest Gump line um, where Sally Fields say, Forrest quotes Sally Fields saying, Diane's a part of life. It is a part of life. None of us gets out of this alive. It's, it's something that we need to regularize in order to, to have more guidance provided for our caregivers at the end of life. But stop along the way and check for understanding. Does this make sense? Does this seem right to you? Um, discuss practical issues. People have said to me, well, Linda, there's nothing in this workbook about how I, what hymns I want sung at my funeral. There are lots of other things to talk about, but that's not what this workbook is about. Um, and you can go online and find lots of other um, helpful guides for the other practical issues that come up. You can discuss those, but this is about what your psychosocial, spiritual, and religious concerns are about death and your own death specifically. So check for understanding along the way. So uh, wherever you are out there, I want you to think for a second, um, when I have done these in-person uh, presentations many, many times, I say, how many of you drove your own car to work this morning? And of course, many, many people used to drive to work every day. Hands go up all over the room. And I said, how many of you were alone on that trip? Almost everybody. Um, so I ask you to think about being in your car by yourself, you're doing nothing wrong, but somebody is texting in an intersection and T-bones you on the driver's side and you're unconscious at the scene. Um, I need you to think through, who are, who are the, how are the emergency responders going to know even who to call? Who, how do they figure that out? And there are a number of ways they do that, but think about it. Um, think about what's in your glove box, which is where they're going to look that would help them figure this out or run your license plates or all the things they do. Wouldn't it be great if there was something in your, in your um, glove box that told them who to call? Um, think about um, other things. Once you get, once they can find that first person, think about the first five people that person is going to call. You're unconscious, you're en route to the nearest trauma center. They are going to be frantic if they got this call. Think about who they're going to call. And if everybody would think through that process, it will give you amazing guidance about who you really should have a caring conversation with, especially if you're unlikely to die of one of those long-term illnesses at this point in your life. You're much more at risk for something precipitous like, like an injury or a wreck. So think about who's, it, who's going to be gathered in the waiting room with a point of view about your care. That's who you should share this with. And it's not a one and done time. We have National Health Care Decisions Day. It comes up April 16th every year, one day after taxes, death and taxes go together. And it gives you an opportunity to hopefully you will, you will celebrate National Health Care Decisions Day this year by doing your own work. And then bring it out every year at, on April 16th and say, what's changed? Has my primary person moved? to Japan or someplace where they're not going to be available to, to be in that role. What's changed? How do I need to update it? You just download another version of it from our website and make a new one. And people say, oh my gosh, if I have more than one out there, uh, people might have both of them and not know which one's the most recent. These are all 
notarized and dated. So they're going to know what your most recent version is if you have more than one. Next. So your homework is to complete your own workbook. Download it, um, call the center and have them mail you one, whatever you want to do. But complete your own workbook and then have a caring conversation with the person you think is most likely to be your best person for making these decisions. And then tell others about your workbook. People say, well, you know, who else should have them? If you're a part of a faith community, maybe your, your um, priest or pastor or faith leader would want a copy. Uh, give one to your primary care doc. Make sure there's one in your file at the hospital you're most likely to be taken to. Um, tell others about your workbook and, and spread, it, spread it around. Next. So um, this is a, a plea to make this not a one and done thing. Um, when you're healthy, renew it annually. If you become seriously ill, when you decline near the end of life, all of these are life events that are signposts along the path of advanced care planning where you need to be paying particular attention. Next. Um, this is just a summary. It's life. Things happen. COVID, of course, none of us could have anticipated. Um, people have accidents. So protect yourself and plan ahead. Uh, learn more, manage your health, revisit your goals. Advanced care planning is increasingly important before, before you become seriously ill. And then it, when people become seriously ill, the planning can get more focused and more specific. Um, and your healthcare provider should definitely be involved at that point. Next. So talk to those close to you, make this a part of your annual physical. Um, many doctors are starting to do this as part of the annual physical because now they get reimbursed for taking the time to have this conversation with you. If your doctor hasn't brought it up, brought, bring it up with your doctor and tell her or, he, or tell him that um, you want to proactively pay attention to end of life in case you are injured uh, or have um, a, a, a virulent experience um, and you want your doctor to know. And more and more doctors are getting plugged into this, especially now that there's reimbursement for it. Then share your workbook with family, doctors, and clergy. Um, when we redo this book, I'm going to put a page in it that has you list everybody you gave it to. But on the cover of this, you can kind of see there's space here. Just write down everybody you gave it to. So when you do another one, when you update it, you'll know, you'll remember who you gave it to that you want to give an updated copy to. And um, if, you, if you do want to rely on paper copies, uh, make sure there's some place that can be found and accessed. Um, no, no safety deposit boxes, please. Next. So the center is available to help you uh, and your family. I, I have done calls with just families who, who want to talk about this together and are afraid to do it by themselves for a variety of reasons. Uh, but we're happy to help uh, Ryan Ferdihertz, uh, who's hosting us today. Uh, his email address is there. I still have my practical bioethics uh, email address that I can access. Or um, we had, I noticed a question that, that came up about how to get copies of this book, practical bioethics, the little flip book, or, the, or the, the, um, the whole workbook. All those are on our website at practicalbioethics.org. Just click on caring conversations and the options come up if you want to buy a bunch. I was I was doing a presentation um, one night at the night shift at Hallmark, uh, Hallmark's Distribution Center in Liberty, Missouri. And a woman came up to me and she said, we've got an annual family reunion coming up. Can I have 30 of those? And um, they're very inexpensive. You can download one or two for free. We ask if you're populating your whole family reunion. Um, there's a slight charge for them, but, but we pretty much are just recouping our print costs. Next. So we thank you for taking your time here today. Uh, we'd love to hear from you in, in the chat or uh, if you have questions, Ryan's gonna take us through that. And um, typically I would have email addresses that I have permission to use, which is not the case on Zoom. So um, if, um, if you wanna email one of us or call one of us, the, the center's 
general phone number here is 816-221-1100. And I've listed my cell phone. Uh, you can get Ryan through the center. You could get me through the center, but I've listed my cell phone. You should feel free to call. I talk to people all the time who are saying, I'm kind of stuck at this point. Um, and um, I'm happy to talk you through it. So you should feel free uh, to do that. And we're very grateful for you joining us um, today. So Ryan, are there questions or comments that you can share with the group? Sure, uh, some questions coming in, um, asking about if there's gonna be a recording for this. Uh, I can discuss with uh, Matthew, one of our colleagues at the center, and we can maybe make this available um, on YouTube and then we can share out that link for accessibility for everyone so that uh, we can revisit this and potentially share this link. Another question is about the videos regarding my directives of how do they stand up in court cases and have they been tested in court? Um, I personally cannot speak to that. I'm not sure. I do know that advanced directives and living wills do have some difficulties depending on each individual state and uh, having the transportable nature of them can be a challenge. Um, a funny anecdote about that is uh, when I was working in uh, the state of Washington, the um, advanced directive was actually split into two different laws and one, the living will was in one law and the healthcare power of attorney uh, was in another law and they updated it so that one had to be notarized and they didn't update the other one. So we actually had asked, uh, situations where a completed advanced directive would be not notarized, which meant that the living will aspect could be uphold, upheld in law but that the DPOA form was not actually upheld in law. So it was a very, awkward and challenging. Um, we can do some more research on that, but uh, for the most part, those types of advanced directives do not stand the test of, uh, do not act, uh, they're, um, I forget what the legal term is, but they're not really the most supportable within uh, court. And But what they really do is they reflect the patient's values. And uh, we have seen that even um, written pieces of paper, if they are um, detailed conversations or detailed expressions of wishes, while they may not be able to Put it on the table and say 100% this is what the patient wanted and have with the immunity and all that that comes with it. Um, having a physician, having family members and having everyone kind of support that decision saying this is the best way that we were able to access this information of what this patient would want and we feel within full confidence that this is what the patient would want. Um, and there's more strength to that. I, I will say the number one weapon against legal action is having these conversations with the um, legal cases happen when somebody's surprised uh, about what's taking place with a family member and that they didn't know they were that sick or they thought a certain family member was making decisions that mom would not have wanted. And that's why I'm saying there's, uh, and I would, I would paraphrase, there's nothing so devastating to a lawsuit as a video of mom saying, you know, when the time comes and I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do this anymore, I'm ready to die peacefully. And I and I appreciate um, you guys getting hospice involved and making sure that's as smooth as possible. I, I, I'm just saying that, you know, lawsuits happen when everybody isn't on board and, and you have the power to make sure that doesn't happen in your family through having these conversations and sharing your wishes. And that's um, a very valuable thing of this whole presentation is the importance of it because um, I have worked as a clinical ethicist uh, for many hospitals and I have seen uh, a lot of situations where um, the advanced directives are not completed. If we had a completed advanced directive, the situation could be very much uh, avoided. So, um, and then also we we're talking about the limits of advanced directives. Um, pieces of paper um, are very challenging. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, language and words. But one of the things that I have frustration with is the advanced directive for the state of Missouri is written at a, I believe, 14.4 grade uh, average with a 26.3 uh, reading comprehension scale. So it's a very, very challenging document to understand. And having um, a patient complete it doesn't necessarily mean that the patient understood everything, but a conversation that comes with it is much more valuable. I also remember a powerful moment where we we're doing an ethics consult uh, the patient was uh, debating on going on uh, a ventilator and going on long-term aggressive measures. And the patient had in their advanced directive would not want aggressive measures, really cleanly stated. 
but then uh, the patient had capacity. I was able to go in the room and look the patient in the eye and say, if you don't go on the ventilator, uh, at least for a time period, you will die without a doubt. And the patient said, you know what, in this situation, maybe, uh, maybe I'm willing to try a ventilator. Um, if we had followed the advanced directive to a letter without the patient able to express themselves, we may have not been able to give that patient the chance that they were looking for. So there are limits to the pieces of paper. It's the best that we can have in some scenarios, but what really comes more importantly is having a detailed conversation, understanding your goals and preferences and knowing that patient, there's a difference between I would want ventilation in all circumstances and I would not want ventilation in all circumstances versus I would want you to give me a chance. I would want you to do everything that you can do that you seem reasonably possible to give me a chance. But if I'm not gonna be able to achieve that success, then I would wanna be as comfortable as possible. That's a more nuanced understanding of medical preferences rather than a binary A or B, yes or no. And, and you can say just that on your our advanced, advanced care plan. I, we've seen, I've seen a couple of things come through where um, obviously um, we have someone here from, from Florida uh, pointing out that they don't require a notarization in Florida. Um, and someone else pointing out Kansas and Missouri have different rules, which is exactly right. The center's version of this um, encourages you to uh, have, have it notarized and witnessed. And if you have it notarized in, 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 in our state and in, in Kansas City, where we are, um, you can live in one, one in Missouri and be hospitalized in Kansas. So we really encourage everybody to do the most rigorous version, which is having it notarized and witnessed. But I'm telling you, of all the experience that all my colleagues have had over 30 years, when the family and the patient are in agreement, this situation goes smoothly. And being in agreement requires conversation and talking to each other and listening to each other and being respectful of somebody's wishes, even though it breaks your heart to think about it. Um, so the, the train wreck case, the son from California flying in and saying, I'm going to sue everybody does happen. But now with Zoom and, and FaceTime and everything, there's no reason that the son from California or, or, you know, Tokyo or wherever the son is or daughter can be involved in the conversation, can hear mom say, this is what I'm doing. This is what I've documented. This is, this is what it looks like. Here's my book. And I hope all of you will fill one out too. Um, it can really save a lot of, of hurt. And literally, we all know cases where families have disagreed, as I said in early in the slides, nobody wants their death to be the reason their family no longer gathers for Thanksgiving or other holidays because they fought over what mom would have wanted. Nobody wants that. Any other questions, um, Ryan? Um, in the or questions, comments? someone has stated that you can stipulate trial periods, which is definitely a good thing to remember. And um, a, a closing idea that I would like people to consider is this is not just, we talk about this being very individualized and protecting your rights and your health care, but it's also a gift. It's a gift to family. Uh, a lot of the studies coming out have shown that family members who don't have these types of information available will show signs of PTSD and uh, trauma afterwards, of questioning, of uh, real um, moral stress of, did we do what is right? Did we do what mom and dad wanted? Uh, we wanted to make sure you honor their uh, medical preferences, but you also want to don't overly aggressive. So it's a really challenging prospect. So um, completing it, not just so your medical preferences are upheld, but also so that your family can feel more comfortable uh, with these medical decisions that are going to be very challenging. Um, it's a gift for them. And it's also a voice for when you're voiceless. Uh, we believe in the medical principle of respect for autonomy. And what we always say is just because a patient doesn't have capacity, it doesn't mean that they don't have the right to autonomy anymore. It means our ability to access that autonomy became much more challenging. But it's still incredibly important that we are able to understand what would a patient say. And a lot of times when we're doing ethics consults um, to help family members understand uh, what we're thinking is if your loved one or if patient so-and-so were in the room right now and could speak to us, what would they say? And it's really about making sure that medical preferences and the right to autonomy is upheld throughout your hospitalization and essentially throughout your life. 
Well, we appreciate all of you um, being with us this afternoon. And I, I, will, I will just say that a phrase we use over and over about advanced care planning is the greatest peace of mind possible. As Ryan points out, there are all kinds of ways this, this is, can potentially be extraordinarily difficult, but the greatest peace of mind possible is the legacy we all wanna leave in our families so that, that people are certainly sad to see us go, sad to be without us, but believe in their hearts that they honored our wishes. And the only way they can do that is if they know what they are. So thank you all for being with us this afternoon. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you for the um, supportive comments in, in the chat. And um, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. So Ryan, can you see the, the chat? Yes.